Hey folks, welcome back. Today's video is fun and packed with tons of information all about plantain. Not only will you get to learn some of the medicinal benefits of this plant, but I will show you just how confident I am that plantain works by stinging my arms with stinging nettle and I will be making a spit poultice covering one arm and then leaving the other arm bare and we'll see which one heals faster from stinging nettle rash. So if that sounds like an interesting experiment to you, stay tuned, that's in the middle of the video. And then at the end of this video, we're going to make a do-it-yourself homemade plantain salve. So if you're interested in that, stick with us to the end. The salve is a great way to capture the skin healing benefits of plantain in a preservable form so that you always have it on hand anytime that you need it. It also makes great gifts. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into all of the reasons you will absolutely love plantain. There are two medicinal species of plantain, Plantago major and Plantago lanceolata. Plantago major has broader leaves with longer seed heads, while Plantago lanceolata has narrow leaves and more stubby seed heads. Both have similar health benefits, However, in this video, I will be focusing on Plantago major as this is what grows wild locally and I'm most familiar with. Medicinal plantain should not be confused with the banana-like fruit native to South America, whose common name is also plantain. Herbalists are usually referring to the ground cover plant. Plantain is native to Eurasia, but common throughout the world including North America, South America, Southern Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. In previous videos, I may have misidentified plantain as a self-seeding annual. In some locations, it acts as an annual, but it is actually a perennial plant. Plantain was commonly called white man's footprint by indigenous Americans because of its tendency to grow in the paths compacted by wagon wheels as early American colonists traveled west. Plantain is an herb that tolerates a great deal of trampling and compaction, as demonstrated here by my cat Chucky. It is especially common along footpaths, bike trails, and roadsides. This year, my husband Christopher and I discovered a huge patch of plantain along a local bike trail that I love to frequent. I've always thought that plantains look like mini hostas because of their broad leaves, rosette pattern, and distinct veins. One of the easiest ways to identify plantain is to pick off a leaf. If the stem of the leaf has little threads or rat tails, that's a very good sign. I've yet to pull off a single leaf that does not have this feature. Both the leaves and the seeds of plantain are edible and used medicinally. Young leaves can be added to salads, raw or cooked, and the seeds can be used as a bulk laxative. All aerial parts of plantain can be used medicinally. It is considered in traditional Chinese medicine to have cooling, moistening energetics, though it also has some astringent properties that may make some consider it a more neutral herb in some aspects. This herb has some powerful properties that can be used both internally and externally. For example, plantain, when taken internally, has constituents that increase the production of nitric oxide and a chemical compound called TNF-alpha, both of which help to fight infection and prevent tumors. The leaves, when ingested, are highly anti-inflammatory and may help with certain conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, while the mucilaginous quality of the seeds help to protect the stomach lining and reduces stomach acid, helping to prevent acid reflux and the formation of stomach ulcers. The ingested seeds can also lower the presence of certain enzymes which contribute to the deterioration of the liver. Externally, plantain continues to shine. The highly effective anti-inflammatory qualities help to reduce the time it takes for wounds to heal, including rashes, burns, bug bites, and even bee stings. Its astringent qualities help to draw out infections, and many herbal testimonies rave about its ability to draw thorns and splinters out of the body. Plantain also has analgesic qualities, meaning that it can help to provide some pain relief as well. Applied topically, plantain can provide a great deal of relief for insect stings, itchy bug bites, poison ivy rash, and even stinging nettle rash. 
Speaking of nettle rash, I've wanted to do this experiment for quite a long time, so today's the day. I went outside and swatted both of my arms with a branch of nettle so I can truly put a plantain spit poultice to the test. A plantain spit poultice is one of the simplest herbal remedies for the skin. If you find yourself with a bee sting, splinter, or nettle rash, search the ground for some nearby plantain, take a leaf, and chew it in your mouth until it's nice and mushy. You can apply the poultice to the wound directly, and the combination of the skin healing enzymes in your spit and the healing properties of plantain leaf will work together to draw out the infection and soothe the sore, itching, or stinging area. I chewed the leaves and applied it to the bandage to fully cover the rash and hold the poultice in place for about 20 minutes. The results really speak for themselves. The arm with the plantain poultice is noticeably less swollen and red than the untreated arm, even after just 20 minutes. The arm that was covered with the spit poultice um, the pain was significantly reduced even within a few minutes and after that 20 minute period uh, as you could see in the comparison video the swelling had gone down quite a bit you could still see the tiny pinpricks of where the nettle had stung me um, but the general area was just much less swollen and overall it did heal much faster. I haven't had a chance to try out my plantain salve on nettle sting, so I'd be curious to see how well that works, if maybe it even works better. Um, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not planning on stinging myself again, so... Speaking of the salve, let's go and make some in my kitchen. I do want to apologize for the quality of the video. My kitchen doesn't have great lighting and all of my videos are shot on my cell phone. It might look a little grainy in some spots, but it should still be packed with plenty of great information, um, all of the information you'll need to make your own plantain salve. All right, so now we are ready to start making a plantain salve. So this salve is an oil, an olive oil infusion of a few different herbs. So this is two cups dried calendula, two cups usnea, and two cups plantain. And I uh, dried and powdered these herbs and then combined them with some warm olive oil. And that's been sitting for about a month. I also brought a mortar and pestle. So I'm trying out something new. I'm gonna make some regular salves where I don't add anything extra um, other than the beeswax and the infused oils. And then I'm gonna do a, another set of salves where I add back some powdered, um, some powdered plantain. And this is the scientific name, Plantago Major. So I'm, I'm hoping by adding some really finely powdered plantain back to the salve, it will just increase the topical benefits of um, this infused oil and salve. Uh, of course, we're gonna need our containers to put the salve in. I really like these uh, more shallow amber glass bottles. Um, and you're gonna wanna lid with those as well. I'm not exactly sure how much these hold, um, but we're going to do a cup of oil and then two ounces of beeswax. All right, so let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is strain out our infused oil. So as I said before, I used powdered herbs. Powdered herbs, you're gonna get more um, herb for the volume of the jar, uh, and it's just going to uh, infuse better. You'll get more potency if you use powdered herbs because there's just there's more that you can fit in the jar, and by breaking it down really finely, you're increasing the surface area, which helps um, the oils to infuse that much more efficiently. So I'm just gonna take off this label because I'd like to hold on to that and not get it all oily. Let's just move our other equipment here as well. So I like to just throw this, it's a, what's called a nut milk bag. So typically this is used for making different nut milks, straining, straining the material out. I find that these work really well for straining out oils as well, oils and tinctures. And this oil has been infusing for about a month. Now we're just gonna squeeze the bag 
to get all of that oil and goodness out. So as far as the olive oil I used, I just use extra virgin olive oil, the same that I use um, in my kitchen to, to cook. And I can tell that this infused really well because it is not, while it's still that green color, um, it's much, much darker than the regular olive oil. And this is more than one cup. So what we can do with the remaining oil is jar it. Um, if you're not using it to make a, a bunch of salves, this would make more salves than I have jars to contain it in. And then you can add this oil to roller bottles. Roller bottles are, work really well for applying to um, small cuts and scrapes and rashes. Uh, you just put it in there and then it's, it's a special type of bottle with a, a little ball um, on the end of it and you can just roll it on the skin, kind of similar to like a, a lip gloss or a lip balm. And that's a great way to use your extra oil. Just gonna wash my hands. All right, so now we're gonna measure one cup of oil. And another way that you can use your extra oil, as you can see, there's still quite a bit of oil left here. You could just try infusing it again, powder up some more herbs, throw it in here, and make an extra strong infusion. I'm not sure at what point the oil becomes completely saturated, but hey, you could try making an extra strong infusion just by continuing to add powdered herbs to your already done infusion. We're gonna set this aside. And now what we need to do is cut a two ounce section of beeswax. So for this, you're gonna need a ratio of one cup of oil to two ounces of beeswax. So that's 659 grams. Let's change that to ounces. So one pound, 7.25 ounces. All right, so we're not gonna need very much of this at all. Cue me learning very quickly why people prefer to buy the easy measure wax pellets rather than the blocks of wax. I ended up heating a steak knife and melting through the wax to cut it. Zero out of 10, do not recommend. Ah, there we go. Let's weigh this again. That is three ounces. So, wow. Three ounces exactly. That's pretty good. If anyone has recommendations on how to um, cut big blocks of beeswax other than how I'm doing it, I would really appreciate those suggestions. Okay, perfect. This is 2.1 ounces of beeswax. That's, that's close enough for what we're doing here. So now that we have our two ounces of beeswax and one cup of infused oil, we are ready to start using our double boiler system. So what I'm gonna do is add our beeswax to the smaller bowl or the, the smaller pot, and then we're gonna fill this pot with water. So one thing that is important here is to not fill um, your larger pot with too much water. Um, water and wax and water and oil don't mix, so if it starts to splash up, you just wanna make sure that it's low enough that it doesn't end up splashing up into your wax and oil container. This is an extra step not necessary to make basic salves, but I love trying new things every time I make my salves. I'm going to use the mortar and pestle to finely powder some plantain leaves and mix some solids into half of my salves. I did about two teaspoons of powder in each jar. More on how that went later. Now that the beeswax is melted, it's time to add your infused oil. If you pour fast, the different temperatures will cause some of the wax to re-solidify. Just keep applying low heat until it melts back down into liquid form. The last process is super simple. Pour into your clean jars. You can add a few drops of essential oil for scent and stir in before the liquid cools. I added about six drops of tea tree oil into each salve. 
the salves with the powdered solids added back in have a deeper green color. However, I may have added more than could be absorbed by the oil and wax as some of it clearly settled to the bottom before the salve solidified. Next time, I think I might mix the powder into the double boiler to see if I can get a more consistent salve. You can store these salves in the fridge or freezer to increase their shelf life. As long as you keep moisture out, I found my salves to be shelf stable for up to a year. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. I also want to mention um, there's a lot of products that I use in my kitchen that I've talked about in the past. Um, some of my tea strainers, my favorite tea kettles, and uh, most recently one of my favorite purchases is a mason jar vacuum sealer. So normally people will ask me where to get these products and because I live in a rural area and it's sometimes hard to find some of these more niche items in like the Walmarts that are around. Uh, I do often order online on Amazon. Um, so you are welcome to check out my Amazon store. It just links to all of the products that I've bought in the past if you're interested in trying those as well. It's not a very big list of things because I am not a, a big shopper, but definitely stuff that I've liked and would buy again. And if it helps you make uh, more informed decisions with your purchases, uh, these are products that I've had really great success with and I encourage you to check that out. Okay, I think that's it for this video. I will see you very soon in the next one.